the three persons of the Trinity, the three persons of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but it's all God. God is still one. And actually, Jesus quotes part of the Old Testament, what the Old Testament then, but those writings there, which is referred to by the Jewish people as the Shema. And even today, in synagogues, they repeat that verse, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And then Jesus goes on to say, Love the Lord your God, this one true God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then he says, and then the second is like unto it. He said, that's the most important command, but the second one is really just as important in that we are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And of course, the teacher of the law had asked this question to Jesus. He basically tells Jesus, he says, you're right. He says, I understand. I'm getting where you're coming from. You are right when you say the Lord our God is one. You are right when you say, according to God's word, we are to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. You are right when you say that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. And the teacher of the law says this. He says, those commandments are even more important than coming into the temple and offering burnt sacrifices. He's basically saying that's what God wants more than anything. More than our sacrifice. He wants our love. First of all, our love for Him. But as we love Him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, then it's just natural we begin to love others with God's love. This morning, I want us to look at quickly just three things about this answer, this response that Jesus gave to this teacher of all. First of all, I want us to look at the explanation of Jesus. I want to look at his answer just a little bit more specific, a little bit more detailed. Then I want us to look at the example that we find in Jesus' answer. And then lastly, I want us to look at the extent of his answer. You know, there was a man who only had an eighth grade education. But this man just had a really great desire to be a soul winner, to reach people <coughs> for Jesus Christ. Well, for that, he's praying you know, to the Lord, Lord, just bring me to people. Just open up those doors of opportunity for me to share Christ with others. The Lord had brought a lawyer to this man's attention. It really laid this lawyer upon his heart. So this man, with only an eighth grade education, he decided he was going to go see this lawyer, and so he did. And so he goes to see this lawyer, and he begins to tell him about Jesus Christ, about the gospel, about being saved. Well, no sooner had they begun the conversation with this attorney, with all of his legal training, who was very, very brilliant, he just turned everything that this man tried to share the gospel with, and he just turned it inside out. Yeah, he came up with an answer for everything that this man was about to share, that this man was sharing with him about Jesus Christ. Well, after a few moments, the man finally looked at the attorney and he just apologized for coming in and taking up the attorney's time. And he began to walk out and had tears flowing down his face as he's leaving that lawyer's office. But before he walked out the door, he turned to the lawyer and he said, I just want you to know this one thing. He said, I came today because I love you. Well, this man went home and he was just so discouraged. He walked into his house and he told his wife, he says, I don't want to be bothered with anything the rest of the day. I don't want to see anybody. I don't want to talk to anybody the rest of the day. And this man, so discouraged, he just went up to his room and he just closed himself up. Well, a little while later on in the day, this lawyer happened to show up at the man's house. And as he knocked on the door, his wife opened the door. And he said, I'd like to see your husband. And his wife, the man's wife, told him, he said, well, he's not seeing anybody for the day. He said, oh, he said, well, I think he'll see me. Just tell him who I am. So his wife went upstairs, told the man, this lawyer's here to see you. Well, the, the, her husband agreed to let the attorney come in and went into his room. And so when he came into his room, the man said to the lawyer, he said, so why are you here? 
Are you coming just to knock down more of what I was talking to you about? Are you coming to argue with me more? Why have you come? He said, everything I've tried to tell you, you just had some answer for. And the man said, the lawyer said, you're right. He said, I did. He said, but as you were leaving, you made one statement that I really could not give you an answer for. And the man said, oh, really? What was that? He said, as you were leaving, and you turned to me and you said, the only reason you could come to see me today was because you loved me. He said, I could find an answer for that. And he said, I want to know how to be saved. You see, we as believers, as Christians, we who profess to follow Jesus Christ, to walk in His steps, love is absolutely an essential part of our life. In 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, you know, we're told that we can speak with all kind of flowery language. We can speak, as the New Living Translation says, with all the languages of earth, all the languages of angels, but if we don't have love, we are nothing but just a bunch of noisy gongs and cymbals. In other words, we're just making a lot of useless noise if we don't have love. We're told that if we could be great prophets or prophetess, have that gift of prophecy, if we can understand all of God's secret plans, if we possess all the knowledge in the world, if we did not have love, that we would be absolutely nothing. We're told that if we could give everything that we own and give it to the poor, if we even sacrifice our bodies, we can actually brag. We can boast about that. We're such good, upstanding people. But if we didn't have love, we would have gained absolutely nothing. Love, the life of a believer, is integral. You can't profess to be a follower and disciple of Jesus Christ and not love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. As a matter of fact, we're told in 1 John chapter 4, if anybody says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. No missing words there. We're told if anyone does not love his brother who he has seen, he cannot love God who he has not seen. And we're told that he has given, God has given us his command. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is not a recommendation. It's not a suggestion. It says we're given this command. It's a must if we claim to love God. You know, I don't know where each and every one of us in this place this morning, where you are today spiritually. But let me just say this. If you're here today and you are struggling in your life in some way with hatred or resentment or, or maybe some under some kind of pretense, if you're here today, I want you to know that first of all, God loves you. He loves you so much, He came in the person of Jesus Christ. Came to be here with us, sinful, wretched people, to live with us. But not only to live among us, but to sacrifice Himself for us. And if you're here today struggling, with some of those emotions in your life that I mentioned. My prayer is today that before we leave, you just come to the cross, not this cross, but the cross of Christ. You can let this cross be symbolic of it. And you just lay at Jesus' feet. Turn over that hatred, that resentment, that turmoil, whatever struggle you're facing, I'll turn it over to Him and let Him begin to fill you with His love. So what is the example in Jesus' answer this morning? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's loving beyond pretense. That's an authentic, genuine, heartfelt love. It's not only loving in words, but it's loving in actions. He says, love the Lord your God with all your soul. This loving isn't to be nonchalant. It's a very deep, intimate, personal love from deep within you. When he says, love the Lord your God with all your mind, it's a love that flows out of knowing God, but not just knowing God in your head, knowing God in your heart, and actually having a true, genuine experience and relationship with God. 
When he says love the Lord your God with all your strength, it's a love that permeates every single area of your life. It's a love for God above all else. That's your top priority. So what about the examples? In the 16th century, Oliver Cromwell, he ordered a soldier to be shot for crimes that he had committed. And he said at the ring of the tower bell is when the execution will take place. But that night when that hour came, there was no sound that came from the bell. Well, the reason why is because the girl that was supposed to be married to this man, out of her deep love for her fiancé, this condemned man, she climbed up into the tower and with all her strength, she clung and held on to that clapper and that huge bell so that it wouldn't ring. Well, Oliver Cromwell had her brought in before him to explain her action, why she had done that. And she came before him and she just wept and just showed him her bruised and her bleeding hands from holding on to that clapper. And when Cromwell saw that, he was so greatly impressed, he said to her, your lover is alive because of your sacrifice. He will not be shot. See, that answer, the example in Christ's answer, was demonstrated in His sacrifice for us. His bruised and bleeding body on the cross for us. You know, Jesus says here, that second greatest commandment, like unto the first, He says, we are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And I first thought about this morning to ask us this morning for us to think together, how many of you love yourself? Thinking at first, probably most people raise their hand. Yeah, we admit, we love ourselves. But you know what I begin to think in this day and age? It seems like that's a struggle for a lot of people. To be able to love themselves. And I don't know if y'all have found the way I have found so many of those people who seem so confident who seem so sure in who they are. So many times what I've found them, especially as a pastor, it's a cover-up because of their lack of confidence. Because of their lack of feeling they're worth anything. That they have any value to anybody. It's a lack of their love for themselves. Folks, this morning, again, if you're struggling with loving yourself, there is one who loves you beyond what anybody else could will ever love you in this world. If you're struggling this morning with your self-worth, let me say to you this morning, you are worth and valued so much in God's eyes that His Son, Jesus Christ, hung for you, bleeding and dying. Giving His life so that you can have life. That's where my worth is found. Not in anything in this world. Because this world at one point, as long as they find benefit in me, they'll say that they love me. But once I stop being of any benefit to this world, they no longer need me. I'll be thrown away just like a bag of garbage. But my worth, my true worth and value is found in my relationship with Jesus Christ and what He did for me and what He gave for me. That ultimate sacrifice. That's why Jesus said in Luke 9, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. In other words, you love God and you love others before you love yourself. And he must take up his cross daily. There's two words there. Take up your cross. One word, cross. There's the sacrifice. And we love others no matter what the cost is, no matter what the sacrifice is, and we do it daily. It's not just a one-time occurrence. And y'all know as well as I do, to love some people, it does take a daily effort. To love some people, it does take a moment-by-moment moment effort. Y'all know as well as I do. Remember, it is a commandment. And so the example in Christ's answer is that it's a love that is sacrificial. It's a love, too, that will come with great cost. Here's the last thing, the extent. I know many of you are familiar that there are 
four words for, in the Greek for love. There's phileo, where we get our city name Philadelphia from. It means brotherly love. It would be the love that pretty much each and every one of us would normally have for each other as a body of believers, as a family. We're all friends, and, and we like fellowshipping with one another, and we love one another, and we care for one another. That's that phileo type of love. And the second word is eros. That's the romantic type of love. That love that's special between a man and a woman in a marriage relationship. And then there's another word. We don't hear too often. That's why we just hear the three. But then there's another word. It's called storge. It is actually a family love. The love you would have for your blood relations, especially your immediate family. Parents, children, that type of thing. And then there's the agape. That's the unchanging unwavering, unconditional God type love. I always, for years, referred to it as that is the no matter what love. And so when Jesus tells us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, he is saying you have got the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. In other words, your love for God should be unchanging, <coughs> unwavering, unconditional no matter what circumstances or situations you face in your life. When he says love your neighbor as you love yourself, he's saying agape your neighbor as you love yourself. In other words, that unchanging, unwavering, unconditional love for your neighbor. In Luke chapter 10, we also find another account in Luke's gospel of the same story. And when Jesus tells his teacher of the law that you love the Lord your God with all your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then you love your neighbor as yourself, the teacher of the law asks this additional question. He says, well, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus tells a story about a man who has been beaten and robbed and left for dead along the side of the road. And he says, first, a priest comes by. That would be like me. Okay, just think of me as a priest, all right? That would be like me coming by, seeing this man bleeding and dying on the side of the road. And you know what the priest does? You know the story. He just keeps on walking. Hey, this man, no attention. Then he says a Levite comes by. Now, a Levite is like a demon in the tabernacle, in the church. They were those who God set apart specifically to do the work and ministry of the tabernacle, of the church. So that would sort of be like a deacon today when this Levite comes walking by. There's this man bleeding and dying on the side of the road. You know what the Levite does? Poor little pills, man. I'll go see if maybe I can give you some help. And he just walks on. Then a Samaritan walks by. Now, I don't know if you know anything about the, the relationship between Jews and the Samaritan. Of course, this man dying on the road was a Jew. The Samaritan comes walking by. They did not have a very good relationship. Years and years, centuries of tension between these two cultures. Jews did not like Samaritan people. If they had to go through Samaria to get from one place to another, they would completely go out of their way just to avoid it. This whole region. The Samaritan walks by. He sees the man dying on the side of the road. He kneels down, doctors his wound, binds his wound, picks him up, puts him on his animal, carries him into the closest city, takes him to this motel, this inn at the time, and when he tells the law, as Jesus says, who is my neighbor? He asks, Jesus asks him, he says, so who do you think the neighbor was in the story? And the teacher of the law says, I'm sure the man who had compassion on this man that would be. Jesus said, you're right. When we're told to agape our neighbors, we agape ourselves, that means anybody who is in need, anybody who is hurting, and folks, there are plenty of people out in this community, they may not be hurting physically, they may not be hurting emotionally, but there's a lot of people out there hurting spiritually because they're lost. And they need love. They need that agape love. So what is the extent we find in Jesus' answer? Three passages, real quick. I know we're a little bit over. Just bear with me for a second. The first passage is in Ephesians. Paul says, 
always here. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love, this agape love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. When he says that, you're not going to find this kind of love in the world today. So that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And then another passage that shows us the extent of Christ's love. One of my favorite scriptures. John 15, 13. Greater love has no man than he lay down his life for his friends. <clears throat> you know, that's easy enough for most of us, for our friends, to sacrifice. Maybe even to lay down our lives for our closest friends. But even though it says friends here, it doesn't really just stop there. Luke chapter 6. We're told of another time. Where Jesus said, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? He says, even sinners love those who love them. He says, if you do good to those that do good to you, what credit is that to you? Sinners won't do the same. If you are nice to them, they're going to be nice back. He says, if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, again, what credit is that to you? Even sinners will lend people money or clothes or things because they're expecting to get repaid back. But Jesus said this in Luke 6, verse 35. Love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them, give to them, expecting nothing in return. So when we read here, Greater love has no man than lay down his life for his friends. We don't need to stop there. We need to agape our enemies as well. Just as the Samaritan did. This morning, maybe you're here. And my challenge to you today is we talk about these top priorities of 2015. And we've looked at love this morning. Maybe today you need to, for this new year, renew your agape love, first of all, for God. So this year, I'm not talking about a resolution. I'm talking about a daily, disciplined commitment to agape the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Maybe for some of you here today, that would be the very first time you ever do. And the only way you can do that, first of all, is to surrender your heart and life to Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe some of you are here today and you need to make a better commitment, daily discipline commitment this year to agape your neighbor just as you agape yourself. Your neighbor might even be somebody in this church, in this church family. Your neighbor might be somebody in your neighborhood. It might be somebody you work with. It might be somebody you go to school with. That's my prayer today. That we begin with what Jesus says is the greatest 